Okay, um, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, there's just a few things to note. Uh, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. Um, you can send those to me in the chat. Um, and you can send any questions or comments via the Q&A button, and they'll be addressed at the end. This program is made possible by the generous donors, the Cary Library Foundation, and in partnership with Lex Pride. With us today, or tonight, is uh, Professor Jen Mannion. They are an associate professor of history at Amherst College, focusing on social and cultural history and examining the role of gender and sexuality in American life. They are the author of two books, Liberty's Prisoners, Carcer Carceral Culture in Early America, and Female Husbands, A Trans History, which is the subject of tonight's talk. Uh, They're available at the Harvard Bookstore. Uh, so now please welcome Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thanking, thank you for logging on to tonight's program. I'm gonna share a little bit of the framework um, for the project, things that were happening and that I was thinking of um, as I was planning to write the book um, and walk you through some of the main arguments and a bunch of examples of female husbands. And then I really encourage us to think about its relevance um, for this current moment and our future. The transgender rights movement has achieved widespread visibility and recognition in the past decade. But for some people, trans issues seem very novel and modern, a contrast to earlier times, such as their own childhoods in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, when most people accepted the distinct expectations outlined for boys and girls. In hindsight, the women's rights movement and the gay liberation movement both seem quite modest in their critique of gender. Neither demanded an ability to change one's sex legally or medically, the eradication of the distinction between men and women in public life, or a rejection of gendered language. From this perspective then, the demands of the transgender rights movement are in fact radical and novel, seemingly triggered by the dawn of a new century and little else. We are after all living in the wake of the transgender tipping point in part due to highly visible trans women celebrities such as Janet Mock, Laverne Cox and Caitlyn Jenner. Transgender studies is a scholarly field with its roots in the late 1980s and early 1990s. It has revolutionized our understanding of sex and gender Susan Stryker posits transgender as an action rather than a simple fixed identity, meaning that people move away from the gender they were assigned at birth. This offers us an expansive view that has paved the way for historic scholarship. And it's so much more than ident identitarian or an identity-based understanding of the term. To say that someone transed or was transing gender signifies a process or a practice without actually claiming to understand what it meant to that person or asserting a fixed identity onto them. And so in this way, we can see people traveling through life, establishing an ongoing and ever unfolding relationship with gender, which is something that I believe we all do, rather than simply shifting between two fixed binaries. While the transgender community in recent years has coalesced around a set of experiences and language, Studying transing in the long ago past reveals that people took a wide range of paths in challenging gender. There's no singular transgender past per se, but if we turn back the clock to the 19th century, we find an era that belonged to female husbands. James Howe, James Allen, George Wilson, and Joseph Lobdell. Who were they and why should we care? Female husband was a term used to describe someone who was assigned female at birth, transgender, lived as a man and married a woman. Female husbands assumed a legal, social and economic position 
that was reserved for Anglo-American men in small towns and big cities in the UK and the US from 1746 until just before World War I. Female husbands were presented as shocking and controversial figures, often with the headline featuring the word extraordinary. They found joy and love in intimate partnerships with women, entering into legal marriages that were recognized by the state. They challenged essentialist understandings of sexual difference. They demonstrated every day that gender was malleable and it was actually not predetermined by one's sex. In their ability to flirt, charm, and attract female wives, they threatened the stability of heterosexual marriage. They lived lives that in contemporary terms might be described as transgender, non-binary, butch, lesbian, queer, bisexual, or even asexual. But I will argue that trying to pinpoint them into one of those categories is the least interesting way you can actually approach this material. The first so-called female husband was Charles Hamilton. A fictionalized account of their life was the subject of Henry Fielding's book, The Female Husband. They grew up in Scotland at the age of 14, Hamilton put on clothes belonging to their brother and presented themselves as a man. Hamilton secured apprenticeships with two different doctors over the years, gaining knowledge and confidence in both their gender expression and their trade. They set off on their own, traveling to Southwest England and offering pills, ointments, and advice to anyone who would have them. Hamilton rented a room in the house of Mary Creed, where Creed's niece, Mary Price, also resided. The two became involved and were wed on July 16, 1746. They traveled the country as husband and wife, while Hamilton worked selling treatments for common ailments. Around two months of marriage, Mary Price resolved that she was done with Charles. She reported her husband to the authorities and claimed that she had just figured out that Hamilton was not actually a man, triggering an investigation. Mary Price testified that, quote, pre the pretended Charles Hamilton, who had married her, as aforesaid, entered her body several times, which made this examinant believe at first that the said Hamilton was a real man, but soon had reason to judge that the said Hamilton was not a man, but a woman, end quote. The community of Glastonbury requested that Hamilton be punished in the severest manner. Hamilton was sentenced to six months hard labor under the vagrancy laws, and then ordered to be whipped publicly in each of the four towns that they were known to have lived. And I'm gonna show you this image, which is a little graphic and uncomfortable um, that appeared with later editions of, of the book in the early 19th century. Hamilton was seen as a grave threat and their ability to engage in sex with a woman as a man was at the heart of this threat. By their very existence, they exposed the instability of sexual difference. News of such punishments, however, did not deter others from following a similar course. James Howe ran the White Horse Tavern in the Poplar region of London's East End with their wife, Mary, for over 20 years. They had both grown up poor and were put out to work by their families as teenagers. They worked on their feet at physically demanding labor every day at the bar, probably for most of their lives. Only by grit, sacrifice, collaboration, consistency, and some luck did they manage to build a successful business. They worked, paid taxes, and went to church. They donated to the needy, and they socked some money away for the unpredictable future. Life was good, probably far better than either had expected given the hardship and turmoil that marked their early years. This is a picture from the same era where they were married in the same location, which was outside a fleet prison, but it's not actually them. James and Mary found love, companionship, and security in each other, working side by side for the duration of their marriage, 34 years. Mary Howe knew James as a child who once lived in society as a girl 
Together, they decided that James would transgender and live as a man. Mary knew exactly what she was getting into. Who knows, maybe it was even her idea. So much is said about those who visibly reject gender norms and live as men. And so little is said and known about the women who love them, lived with them, and in many ways enabled their gender to be socially legible. Mary's name is not mentioned at all in the popular magazine and newspaper articles that circulated about the couple for over 100 years. These queer wives were often viewed as normal or straight women who were the victims of circumstance or got swept away by one particular man. But there is no denying their queerness, especially for someone like Mary, who chose to marry a female husband. When it came to reporting the news that someone assigned female at birth decided to live as a man and marry a woman, certain questions were always raised, whether in Europe's greatest city or America's tiniest town. Why did they do it? How did they do it? And did their wives know? Abigail Naylor and James Allen met while working in service as a housemaid and groomsman, marrying in 1807 at St. Giles Church in London. After numerous jobs, several relocations, and 21 years of marriage, things came crashing to a halt. James Allen was bashed in the head and killed by a falling piece of timber while working for a shipwright in Dockhead, England in 1829. Allen was declared dead en route to St. Thomas Hospital. The end of James's life was the beginning of Abigail's nightmare. She just lost her husband of 21 years and the primary earner for the family. The coroner overseeing the inquest, Thomas Shelton, struggled with the challenge that Allen presented. The medical students who dressed Allen's body declared Allen female, while Allen's coworkers, employer, and wife knew Allen to be a man. The state of Allen's legal sex remained in limbo suspended between competing claims from medical students asserting female anatomy and a lifetime of relationships, paperwork, and legal documents stating otherwise. Shelton held a copy of the marriage certificate in his hand as evidence to support his view, quote, I call the deceased he because I consider it impossible for him to be a woman as he had a wife. Alan was dead, so there was no further punishment for them. But Abigail was now the object of scrutiny. When a female husband was identified, everyone wanted to know if their wives knew that their husbands were female. Most wives in situations of great distress engaged in selective truth telling and strategic cooperation to minimize violence or harassment. Here you see a letter that Abigail ran in the local newspaper in self-defense. In asking if the wives knew, authorities and reporters were also asking a question about sexual intimacy. Wives in long-term relationships certainly knew the truth of their husbands. The suggestion that they did not and the desire of reporters and the public to believe it is absurd. But the question was a crucial part of the reporting of female husbands and their wives. It established a distance between the pair. It allowed readers to imagine that their relationship might have been a sexless one. The alternative was too dangerous. In most accounts, newspaper editors left the question unresolved, knowing that it might motivate readers to buy the next week's paper. Newspapers played a crucial role in the circulation of information about female husbands. In the 18th century, they reported a wide variety of local, regional, and even international news. The public life of print culture was expansive. People shared copies of newspapers and read stories aloud in pubs and coffee houses, in reading circles and boarding houses and shop floors and libraries. By printing news of female husbands, the press asserted the inclusion of this group in civil society. All types of British newspapers reported on female husbands, from late 18th century dailies devoted to advertising, to the established papers aimed at middle-class interests, to the cheap late 19th century weeklies. The North American press was no more discriminant. 
Features about female husbands can be found in the 18th century stalwart, the Pennsylvania Gazette, which is widely recognized as the New York Times of the 18th century, and in every imaginable local and regional paper amid the 19th century press explosion. The New York Times ran stories in the 1870s that included more fiction and were actually less reliable than some of the small town upstate papers. Though the widely popular men's sporting tabloid National Police Gazette began to regularly feature such accounts in the 1880s, they were no more scandalous than the accounts that were published in mainstream dailies for over a hundred years. This practice spread the story of yet another female husband far and wide beyond the circulation of the original reporting press. One summer night in 1836, a policeman walked his beat through the streets of the Lower East Side in New York City. He thought he stumbled upon a drunken sailor sprawled across the sidewalk not far from City Hall. This person, however, belonged to the rapidly expanding class of factory workers, attracted by the promise of wage work and regular meals on dry land. Officer Collins brought the fallen man to the station in a cart. At some point, Collins realized the person was not a sailor and suspected that they were not a man either. The drunken labor was a Scottish immigrant named George Wilson. Wilson was found just a few blocks from the factory on Water Street where they worked making fur caps for Joseph Barron. Wilson and wife Elizabeth had been married for 15 years prior to this incident in 1836. While detaining Wilson, the police interrogated Elizabeth about their relationship and her husband's gender. Under these very stressful and possibly violent conditions, Elizabeth said that she married Wilson, quote, thinking him at the time to be a male and only learned, quote, the prisoner's real sex once they were on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic heading for America. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, Elizabeth noted and the newspaper reported, quote, they have continued to live and labor together as man and wife in harmony and love. By the mid 19th century, the women's rights movement took off in the US. Campaigns for legal rights in marriage, dress reform, better wages, suffrage, and greater educational opportunities anchored the mainstream movement. Radical activists integrated racial justice with feminism, working for peace, Indian rights, the abolition of slavery, and expanded rights for free black men and women. Debates about the similarities and differences between the sexes were an important part of public discourse. Feminists themselves had wide ranging views on the subject, though most agreed that transing gender undermined their cause. Even the bloomers caused a stir that made many uncomfortable, a scene which is represented in this image. Critics of women's political advocacy, autonomy and equality use the language of gender to undermine their efforts by calling them masculine, manly, or at the very least, not womanly. Such rhetoric was rooted in older arguments from the late 18th century that women who, who were too well read might develop masculine minds. But this critique gained renewed potency as more women rejected conventional expectations by wearing bloomers, refusing marriage, and standing as political critics of slavery, war, and violence. Popular attitudes in this era towards female husbands generally became more hostile. Observers might strategically use the term woman husband to reduce, erase, or really minimize the threat of female masculinity that the female husband suggested. This usage also served to naturalize the category of woman really conflating it with biological sex and disguising all of the learned norms and behaviors that go into making one a woman. Other things were happening too. The 1850s and 60s were marked by the growth of the carceral state and really the professionalization of policing, targeting enslaved and newly freed African-Americans, the poor, immigrants, and really anyone who challenged the social order. Antebellum era views that tolerated female sailors, female laborers, others who had transgender in the earlier era, 
out of sympathy that women's economic prospects were so abysmal. Well, these sympathetic views seem to fade once the prospect of women's actual political and economic autonomy became a more real possibility that was vocally articulated. Gender nonconformity and transing was increasingly policed by the expansive police forces and new laws popped up in municipalities across the country prohibiting for the first time explicitly cross-dressing. And these from roughly the 1840s are the earliest ones, 1850s, 1860s, and then 70s, 80s, 90s, turn of the 20th century, they just proliferate um, across the country. For those assigned female at birth, living as a man was never without risk. For some, it was filled with hardship and danger. Such was the case for Joseph Lobdell, a hardworking and resourceful person who grew up in Westerloo, New York. Lobdell had considerable responsibility in their family from a young age. As someone who was perceived as a young woman, Lobdell was celebrated for their devotion and many talents, including a knack for hunting, farming, reading, writing, and teaching. They published a memoir describing their early years entitled The Female Hunter of Delaware and Sullivan Counties, published in 1855. In it, Lobdell complained of the hardships of supporting a family on the wages available to women. They were confident that they could do any work that a man did and set off to do so, now presenting fully as male. This decision marked a new course in their life, one filled with many new experiences, feelings of visibility and recognition in their manhood but also many feelings of erasure and hurt in the face of hostility. Lobdell had their gender challenged repeatedly over the next several decades in the court of law, the court of public opinion, and finally at the behest of their birth family who had them declared insane and institutionalized. Their beloved wife of nearly 20 years, Marie Louise Perry, was misled by Joseph's brother James into believing that Joseph had died. James even circulated a false obituary in the newspaper. It took Marie Louise nearly a year to find out the truth. Such was the cruelty with which family members and mental health officials treated those who transgender in the late 19th century. Lobdell's gender rendered them unfit to live freely. This made Lobdell one of the first subjects of sexology in the US whose life, gender, and sexuality were dissected under a microscope by Dr. P.M. Wise, who published about this um, in 1883. And this is just a little snippet um, from some of that research. At the turn of the century, the female husband moniker in the media no longer clearly established that the subject of consideration lived as a man. It also referred to a feminine, seemingly emasculated man or a woman of any gender who was in a relationship with a woman. Sexologists characterized those with transgender identification as pathological and abnormal. They were declared homosexuals. The carceral state wielded its authority in the service of ridding society of those who threatened its order. These two forces, sexology and the carceral state, created tremendous incentive for people who were transing gender to make themselves as undetectable as possible, to find other routes to express and experience their gender, or to reframe their masculinity as a tool for realizing same-sex desire. In conclusion, Despite all of its attendant hardships of a life of transing, this path was not without its privilege. Within the British Empire, settler colonialism, slavery, and war determined the conditions for and parameters of most people's lives. Female husband narratives de demonstrated a freedom, a self-determination, and mobility that were quite hard to come by. In a way, they represent what Lisa Lowe describes as the liberal affirmation of individualism, civility, mobility, and free enterprise that is at the heart of modern liberalism 
Female husbands were not simply disruptors of heteronormativity and sexual difference, although they were both of those things. They were also empowered by and helped to stabilize liberalism, including the gender binary and its attendant whiteness. Female husbands were white. We don't know what motivated each individual person. In that respect, the subjects of this study absolutely confound our contemporary notions of gender identity. There's no way to ask them if they were women or lesbians or trans people or, or butch or what pronouns they prefer. This should not, however, undermine the power that they offer us as a window into our collective past. In requiring us to learn about them as they were perceived by others, female husbands refuse us a simple self-determined assertion of gender identity. In writing about them, I wanted to allow for a trans reading of their lives without foreclosing on the idea that some may have identified with the category of woman. While most female husbands did live seemingly trans lives, they also demonstrate the tremendous overlap between categories of gender and sexuality, refusing a simple reductive reading with one or the other as a driving force. And often in the sources, you find that it's the combination of things. It's that they transgender and they were having sex with a woman and in a legal marriage as a man, that all of those things combined are what made them so threatening. I hope that I have been true to the lives and legacies of female husbands and their wives in this telling. These accounts, like our lives, are marked not only by resilience, love, and joy, but also vulnerability, loneliness, and conflict. Female husbands and their wives live extraordinary lives. This history has been written and it will not be erased. It is true and it belongs to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody has uh, questions, you can type them in the Q&A. Um, button, or uh, if you raise your hand, I can also unmute you. Um, there's one uh, that came in here now. Um, they said they're fascinated by the idea of transing gender as a kind of trouble for feminist practice in the 19th century. It seems like the current UK and US turf movement and the rise of gender critical academic work echoes these anti-trans roots. Um, there's two questions here. What weight did feminists have about growing legal restrictions and medical terminology on or about trans practice at the time? And did they actively support these sanctions slash discourses? That's a great question. I don't <laughs> know. And I don't know if anybody's actually worked on it, if you want to work on it. Um, I was only able to find like threads, you know, trying to find people who are identified as women's rights activists in the 19th century and even the late 18th century, acknowledging that they knew about this practice and these people, like that actually ended up being the challenge. And so um, I, I haven't thought about this in a while, but I think it was Priscilla Wakefield and it, it was actually, a, it was a Brit, another, it was a British feminist. I think it was in, in the writings that I found them one of them identified James Howe by name, although by their birth name, their female name, and spoke of them as a terrible person and a terrible example. Um, they sometimes struggled with female soldiers who transgender for a time and then sort of kept moving through the world in their gender and lived as women and were known as women after their time having lived as men. So they, for some of them, they were heroes, right? And that's why, oh, since we're in Massachusetts, um, I have a little section on Robert Shirtliff. And that's why some feminists do of course own and claim Deborah Sampson as, as a strong ancestor. And so there's like a mixed record on the soldier types, but a female husband is just crossing like too many boundaries um, in not just transing gender for a long time, but knowingly having sex um, with at least one woman and entering into 
legal marriage. The other place where it comes up, I don't have evidence that women's rights activists were responsible for the introduction of anti-cross-dressing laws. In some of the stories around someone named Albert Gelf, um, who I talk about in chapter six, there is, a, the New York state stories are kind of where some of the cases get mixed together because there was so much feminist activism at that time and a bunch of uh, female husbands. And in some of the records there, it's when they do realize that there's actually no law against cross-dressing. And so on that basis, they get out of jail sooner than they would have otherwise, because they realized there actually wasn't an explicit law that they broke. And some woman who's writing to the press, like in defense of Albert Gelf is also basically like, listen, you know, it's become like a really positive, powerful thing for women to wear trousers and, you know, and that this is something that we're fighting for. So it's a mixed record. And I do think that is an important act part of the story to remember if, if somebody wants to research your question, you or someone else, because it is a great question. It's always mixed. It's actually, it's not, there are always feminists supporting transing gender and understanding that disrupting gender in all different ways is part of the, the larger goal, right? For liberation. Um, for women. And so it's, it's a mixed record there. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, to, uh, let me see. Yep. To uh, what extent do you feel like the press informed public opinion about sex difference and female husbands versus merely reflecting existing cultural beliefs? Um, it's, you know, I think it's like a circular thing, but I think for the, for our purposes in trying to study the history of gender and sexuality, the important thing here is that we take the center of power and authority away from doctors and sexologists who have had it in our sort of public knowing and public memory for a hundred years because of their tremendous volume of writings at the turn of the century and how much the early generation of historians of sexuality in the 1960s, 70s and 80s relied on their sources and say actually the newspaper, this kind of crazy, almost a little, you know, a little bit anarchist because like the newspaper industry was exploding during in the mid 19th century, everybody could have a newspaper. So it represents a real diverse, like, you know, collection of thought from a lot of different kinds of people. And the fact that newspapers were so caught up in this story is the exciting thing to me, right? That it, it, instead of thinking that it's this elite select group of doctors behind closed doors who are coming up with these theories, when you read them against each other, and I have this a little bit later in the book, some of the early sexology reports are pulled like right from the newspapers. Like, so, you know, all of these things are in conversation with each other. And I would never say, I think it's a chicken and the egg in terms of newspapers and societies, but the newspaper gave these stories life. And so instead of a case of a female husband and their wife just being known in a community, it gets picked up and reprinted hundreds of times, it, you know, and, and literally like, and all over, it, all across the Atlantic, like in the US and the UK, like at least they, it was very much like an Anglo-American story, but they were reprinting stories about cases in both directions. So it just had played a tremendous role in making these figures like, pretty widely known about, which is shocking when you realize none of us have ever read about them or heard about them before. Um, there's uh, another question. It's um, when you said that female husbands were all white, does that come from a sexological definition of female husbands or a summary of newspaper representations? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's just like an archival conclusion. Um, it's really about who, you know, female husband I use as a cultural category, right? So it's how it was defined and circulated in the press. And in that way, it was never used 
in reference to a couple who were designated as being some other, you know, racial or ethnic background. So that doesn't mean that I don't think people um, of other racial or ethnic groups lived lives that fit similar contours. I, we don't have record of them in like being situated and, and celebrated and also, you know, criticized and punished within this framework. Um, another one is, uh, if female husbands was a concept rooted in whiteness, how did people think of transing gender and similar relationships among Black and Indigenous peoples, for example? Yeah, I mean, I could definitely speak more to, you know, 19th century African American experience and, and relationship to this subject, because I was fully expecting that there would be African American female husbands, because the press is, you know, so many of the same forces that are interacting with and defining female husbands, like the carceral state, vagrancy laws, um, newspapers, they're really obsessed with um, enforcing slavery, uh, with, you know, people who are escaping slavery, um, and, and a, a lot of questions of mobility and movement among African Americans. So, there's every reason, you know, that, that these lives and experiences are, you know, appearing in the press simultaneously, but Black people who transgender are never treated in the same way or written in, written about in the same way. And I think there are a lot of different reasons for it, but I can just say within the context of my research, which was mostly 19th century, uh, it's kind of, it's, the, it's like a long 19th century project. Um, when African Americans were spoken of as transing gender, they were either not given any names or they were only given first names. And so I have, I talk about a couple of these cases where they're trans masculine or assigned female at birth people who transgender and live as men. And they're more likely to be in relation to the carceral state. So I write about someone, I think Charles Williams, I think was his name, who was arrested for stealing a hog and sent to prison and determined to be assigned female and kind of the ordeal that ensues. Um, for trans feminine people or people who are assigned male who transgender and you know live as women, they're more likely to be referenced in relation to sex work. So there's just this totally different way because of racism, because of um, mobility, because of the carceral state, because of, you know, C. Riley Snorton is, you know, the most, who's done the most work on this subject in terms of transing and blackness um, in general, but especially in the 19th century, the way that African Americans were really denied like access to the gender binary in a way that it was just complicated. And because part of the core of the way racism work is that black women were really denied the respect of womanhood and black men were denied the rights and respect of manhood. So racial difference plays a huge role in how gender functioned and was defined. Um, you know, I, I know much less about Native Americans in this context, and they didn't appear in the sources, um, except to say that there is Joseph Lobdell spent some time in Minnesota. Um, and well, actually, both in their life in upstate New York and in Minnesota, um, there's uh, some references to them interacting um, with Native people. And so I just kind of speculate on that a little bit. But there's it's, it's not really the story um, in the newspaper records. Um, another question is, can you speak to the role of religious institutions and or theologies? Well, I actually hadn't thought of this, but in some way the church plays an unexpected role because the church in most of these cases um, was the site of a, a formal official marriage and where these 
relationships were given like religious and legal standing and, and record it in the books. So um, and you know, I think there is another way because this is such a because my central archive was the press. And then I did all this other digging in other kinds of records to verify whatever I could from the press story. So birth certificates, marriage certificates, taxes, things like this. But because it's such a press driven story, um, it's, and at least in the kind of press, the presses that I ended up using, it was like not religion at all, right? It was like civil society. It was this big, big and increasingly bigger way of having a public life and communicating about norms and values and politics and economics, where religion actually seemed to play a minor role. Um, <clears throat> someone said, uh, so fascinating. I wonder if you'd talk a bit more about how these female husbands reaffirmed a gender binary even while you worked so hard to tell their story as without those binaries, do you suspect in your use of quote, they, that your characters uh, would have preferred to live on a more expansive continuum? Huh, good question. Well, first let me explain the they. Um, the they was like a writing tool that I came to after probably hundreds of conversations and dozens of sleepless nights which was how could I write about these lives in an open holistic way without creating false moments of disruption, like as if I, as if, as if like they, like if you're trans now, right? It's part of, you know, trans identity and affirmation is to not have people, well, first of all, like talk about your, other name, you know, the sex that you were assigned to birth or make that like a big deal, right? And it's like, you know, sometimes people so awkwardly say, well, I knew so-and-so before they transitioned when they went by X, right? And that's just like painful and awkward. And like, so I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to kind of also do a, that kind of move. Um, and some of the husbands actually were non-binary. Like they were known for whatever reason to sometimes present as male and sometimes present as female. And so you can see some of them throughout the book. You know, the other big unknown for us is, you know, if they, and again, I think I don't care about this. Like this is not interesting to me at all, but it is really interesting to some people like what motivated them to transgender and live these lives. So do we think of them as people who were principally driven by gender and gender identity? And that is why they transgender and did this. Or do we think of them as people who are principally driven by sexuality and a desire to be in a sexual relationship with women? And that's why they did that, right? So some people invested in that hard, clear division, which we'll never know. I mean, if anybody finds the records that can answer that question, fine, I'll accept that answer. Um, but without that, to me, that's just like the least interesting thing. The fact is that they lived as men and they married and loved women. And so how can I write about that? without alienating or perpetuating a falsehood that kind of falls on one of, these, one of these lines or the other. So that was one of the ways that I ended up with writing about them as they. And the final one, and this is just like for super history geeks, you know, or textualists or literary people is in the actual newspaper articles themselves, all different kinds of pronouns are used. And it is fascinating to see when the press uses he, when the press uses she, sometimes they use it. Um, I don't think they ever actually use they, but I wanted that change in the press and the records to be visible to you, the reader, interacting with this the story and not have my editorial decision about pronouns to like override 
your experience of that. So that's why I use they. And I also just think they is great and cool and it's a wonderful addition to our gendered lexicon um, for those who find it liberating and expansive. Um, I forget the other part. Okay, so the other part of your question is, do female husbands reify the gender binary or not? So it's like both. I mean, I think I wrote a paper in college, which I will forever regret and be embarrassed about, but where I argued that like butch femme couples were reproducing, you know, heteronormativity and that it was what? like a really conservative thing <laughs> because I was just starting to think about these things. My partner just like yelled in while well, you heard her anyway. Um, so there is a way that female husbands do that. And that's the only reason that they get to have the lives that they have because they fit into um, society in their gender and in their marriage. Um, to a, a queer wife and a female husband. At the same time, now I'm older and wiser and I've lived more and I've read more and I think it's, you know, just superficial and simplistic to claim that they weren't also incredibly disruptive of, you know, the gender binary um, in the process because they transgender, right? Which was like fundamentally something that you're not supposed to be able to do in a, you know, in a society with a rigid gender binary. So of course it's both of those things. Um, and that's why it's fun to think about. Um, were there places or safe havens for female husbands and their wives to go to connect? Oh, that's such a sweet question. I, you know, I wish I knew, I wish I had records of that or evidence of that. It's just, it's one of the hardest things about this project is feeling like, or that they, they lived isolated lives. And, and, well, and, and I have no idea, but I don't have any evidence of their communities and their friend networks. And, it's as much a problem of the archive and historic method and the fact that I really do adhere to a traditional historic method because it is important to me, um, but that someone else doing a different kind of project or someone else even doing historical fiction could do some work on this front and, and it would be really cool. It's just like a really absent um, dimension of their lives that makes me sad to not really like have access to. Um, and are there examples of uh, female husbands having children either by themselves or either themselves or by marrying women who already had children? Yes, so there's definitely some kids in this book. Um, Joseph Lobdell gave birth. Um, they were married to a man for a while. It was like a terribly abusive relationship before they transgender and went off. Um, some Henry Stoke, who was in Manchester, England, married their second wife. Their first wife outed them to a lawyer who went to the press and it was a terrible, messy divorce. Um, but their second wife had at least one child and who was said to identify with and relate to Henry as a father and as a father figure. Um, and there are a couple others. I think the other takeaway about kids, however, which I found shocking is in the cases where the female husbands gave birth before they transgender, and that was known about, and it sort of comes out in the, you know, the case of these court proceedings or whatever, no one ever said, oh, and they, and they usually like, you know, leave their children behind with some other family member or whatever, but no one ever says they're a terrible mother. <laughs> Like no one ever says, or even they're a terrible parent. No one ever says that. Um, they're always measured against manhood and husband 
husbandhood, husbandness in the press accounts, which I also find as like a pretty significant affirmation of their having transgendered. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Thanks. These are really great questions. Thanks for making me think. We have a couple more if you'd like to sure. yep. continue. Um, uh, there's, um, let's see. There's a comment um, that women wearing female garb has always been practical um, as a way to get by in a world that would not allow women to participate in society or do the job they felt they were called for, i.e. Joan of Arc, um, George Sands, which I had a question mark next to, but I'm not sure. Uh, and these female husbands who found a ticket to their sweethearts by wearing male garb, it never seemed it was about identity, but practicality. Do you have a comment on that? So I think my... Um... I, 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 you know, I, he, I hear that point, and that's the interpretation offered in every history book I read my whole life, um, and mostly through grad school too. Right? Is there's always a utilitarian explanation, and I think it's our job to ask why. Like, how, well, first of all, who wrote those? Like, who thinks that they know? Like what really motivated people and why are we as like you know critical thinkers so willing to just accept this simplistic like utilitarian explanation you know when i think about my life and my choices maybe this is just like the plight and the problem of modern life but everything feels like really complicated and like there are like lots of things going on and so you know why don't we allow like, you know, desire or, you know, any number of factors as having contributed to someone's decision to do that. And also that everybody's not the same, right? So yeah, there are tons of references in the 19th century newspaper to women putting on men's clothes to hop on a train and, you know, cross to the other side of the city or the other side of the state without being harassed. Like that's there, that's real. Like there's just like lots, you know, but that doesn't mean that for the next person or for the female husband or the female soldier that it wasn't also something else. Um, and that my job as someone who, you know, again, I really respect the archive and historic method. That's my training. I also, study feminist and queer and trans theory and think that's really helpful in opening up how we think about things. That I think it's our job, just as we would want for ourselves, not for people to have like a simple reductive explanation for you know why we make the decisions we make, to also kind of retain some of that capaciousness um, for people in the past. And that's how I approach the writing of this. So I'm never invested in saying no, that person, you know, was was not motivated by this or by that. But like, how do we know what might it have been? What are like all of the different possibilities? And, you know, most it's it's actually if you really push on it hard, I think the most sexist reductive thing to accept the explanation that, you know, women you know, that, that women were just like, you know, that all of this was just like utilitarian and because they faced so much hardship and discrimination that like they weren't crafty and creative and passionate and curious and that there couldn't have been like all these other things um, going on for some people in the past. Um, let's see. Uh, did the concept of female husbands extend past Europe uh, slash the United States? And what challenges does Western understanding of sexuality and gender create for those who study queer history? So, you know, some of you might be familiar with um, an, an older work. I, I think it's called Female, Female Husbands and Boy Wives by Will Roscoe. It should be right off the tip of my tongue. Um, who was an anthropologist. And so there is a whole other life that the category 
female husband has in the African context. And there's a bunch of scholarship about it. And it's very interesting. And it's a, you know, a 20th, it's like 1930s, 1940s, like it definitely sort of starts appearing references to female husband or woman husband in anthropological studies about Africa in right when female husband is no longer used um, in reference to white Brits who transgender um, in the US or the UK. So the, the connection there and that era and the transition is something that I wanna do more work on or somebody else, if somebody else has done more work on that, I'd love to read it because I think that's important and relevant. Um, you know, my, one of my takeaways from this project is that, you know, there's just like so many different trans histories and that it's not, and it's one of the reasons why our current language and framework in many ways is mostly not helpful for trying to understand the past because there were really like dozens and maybe even hundreds of different categories in which small numbers of people identified or were identified. Right. And so even when you're looking at people who might be roughly analogous um, to a trans or two spirit identity in Native American tribes, each tribe has a different phrase or a couple different words to describe those people. And so there's like tremendous variation and specificity in the trans past. And that's what needs to be further documented and figured out for the next 10 or 15 years. And then we can kind of put it back together and figure out what, what the bigger picture is uh, and, then, and then answer your, your you know, broader question uh, about the implications. But I'm putting together a syllabus right now on global transgender histories. And it's exactly that. It's just like different categories and different ways of defining gender that are, are dramatically shaped and qualified by race and class and geography. And you know, that's, I didn't, I didn't emphasize it much in the talk, but female husbands were laborers, female husbands and queer wives. This was a transing category for white working class people, period, right? And so there is a way that race and class and location are, huge forces in determining what gender norms are expected of you and then also what categories for disrupting or transing gender you have access to and you will be understood through right like kind of which box will you be put into um, it's all those other factors shape how someone will understand your gender transgression and um, thank you everyone for submitting questions. Um, we'll, we'll wrap it up with um, this last one. Um, so uh, they said, thank you for this book. They haven't read many history texts that uh, give them the feeling of being part of a lineage of trans and GNC ancestors. Um, my question is how do female husband narratives fit into the broader history and development of in industrial capitalism and or how did those inform each other? <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a, just like a softball good night question. I know I should have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. First of all, I'm glad that the book made you feel those things and gave you access to that. That's absolutely what I was hoping for. And it's unjust and transphobic um, that we don't have access to histories that include us um, and that allow our lives to make sense and be part of a longer whole. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, the, the industrial, you know, give me the question again. I'll try to take a fair stab at it. Um. <laughs> we, can, we can move on if, if um, we could try a, a more softball question if you want, but um, it's, uh, how do female husband narratives fit into the broader history and development of industrial capitalism or how did they inform each other? Um, 
Yeah, so they're like model workers, right? I mean, one of the most prominent threads that is evident in most of the accounts is like hard work and the centrality of work to one's life, the importance of uh, uh, you know a sound work ethic. Um, people are on the move, right? Not only did you have to move in order to transgender, but then a lot of people, it, it, once they were married and in relationships had to move. So movement, you know, was like one of the overwhelming, you know, defining features of industrial capitalism, right? Just this tremendous um, need for workforce um, to move all over the world and move across the Atlantic and center their lives around work. And so you could do a whole reading of most of the female husband cases through that lens. And, and I hope that you do. I mean, I think trans history is still so new. And so I wrote a book that read these cases, mostly trying to think about well, how do I make sense of sex, gender, and sexuality in these accounts. But there are other very strong themes and you could write a book about female husbands or trans and gender in, in a slightly broader way uh, in relation to your question about the rise of industrial capitalism and have a really strong book. So I hope you do it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. Um, this program uh, was recorded, so it will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search Carrie Library. Um, but uh, thank you again, Jen, that was really great. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for those just like really amazing thought provoking questions. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone and uh, have a good night.